Kazire. Uh, Kazire. Yeah. Friday, Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. And um, now, uh, who would like to kick off with a, um, a summary about um, what is what is a COP? What does what does COP mean? Who would like to maybe uh, Peter? Have you got a, 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 want to kick us off on what COP means? We're just, uh, we're trying to work out what the best arrangement of microphones is. Okay. Is it worth me just um, introducing for the others um, the kind of origination of this of this call um, and how, how, what we're trying to do with it? Okay. Um, we have in Cambridge a lot of, uh, a lot of, students studying all sorts of different things, uh, many interested in, in climate change, many interested in st sustainability, in um, uh, all aspects of um, uh, biodiversity, and the, these annual COP meetings seem to drift through one to the next, and we're up to number 26. And if you ask your average Cambridge students, they, they feel left out of the discussion because they don't know, well, what's the problem? Why are these cops so difficult? Not Why? Only, no, not only what's the problem, but what actually happens there? Are we getting anything done at all? Or is it just a bunch of politicking uh, without, without any progress? And everybody <laughs> going there and having a good time. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, so, and, and what are the stumbling, what are the, what are the, what are the blocks? And students here, are asking these questions and, and we don't know where to get the answers. So what we thought we'd do is to um, have a discussion about, about this. And this was all talked about two or three months ago and I think, Bryony, you were very willing to, um, to help us out with this, con this conversation. Uh, you, you were intending to be here today but for all good reasons uh, you've decided not to come uh, as I think lots of people have, uh, have done. So people are listening to this live stream which is great. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we're at. We're trying to find out from, from, from a rather a starting point of not knowing anything. A little bit, but not too much. Can we get up to speed on what the COP means and what can be achieved and what, what can't be achieved? Seems like a good summary. And the, and the um, I mean, so just because I think I roped everyone into this, so I should explain why I thought it was useful, is because it, it is quite an interesting process, the COP. Um, the negotiations, because quite seldom, it's not very often that people get an inside track into what actually happens in the negotiations. And thousands of people actually attend and take part in side events and have a lot of information. But there is a process going on in parallel. And I don't think people are on call with us. Sorry, Brandy, I can't hear you. Oh, can't you? Yeah. Ah. I, I can hear you. You're just breaking up. Is it, are oh. you breaking up for other people or just for me? It is a bit breaky uppy. <laughs> I can go and sit a bit closer to my my router, maybe. Um, but I was just saying that the reason I thought that Peter and Kelly and Stefano would have good insights is because in their different roles, they've all been very connected to the politics of the actual negotiations. Kelly, in particular has been an actual chair lead of, of the negotiating group and was um, leading on Article 6 until about a year ago. Um, Peter has had a number of roles inside the European Commission um, and has had, had, had an oversight over the European engagement in this uh, process. And Stefano is um, one of the leading advocates around the technical details of Article 6 and works for a group called IET. 
instance, you've got three brilliant minds here who um, I just said, would you mind answering a few questions? Well, that's um, so that I, one of the first questions might be, what is Article 6? And, and why do we keep getting stuck on certain issues, especially 6.2 and 6.4? Why are they so incredibly difficult, it seems, to actually resolve every year? And why don't people talk very much about Articles 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5? <laughs> So, um, I mean, what is Article 6? What's a nice, simple, a simple description? What is Article 6? Stefano, do you want to take that or do you want me to? <laughs> what um, is Article yeah, 6? I'm, I'm, um, I'm happy to, uh, to try and have first go at, uh, at it. Um, so yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be on this webinar. Um, so if I, um, if I want to explain Article 6 in a nutshell, I would probably say that, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the Paris Agreement, you have like a whole different set of uh, building blocks, blocks and, uh, and principles and articles that uh, do different things. And uh, for example, you have one article that explains what the long-term goal should be, an article that explains how uh, parties have to account for their NDC and for how to, to design and keep track of their uh, contributions. And Article 6 is uh, a, re a really peculiar article that uh, basically lays out uh, rules and principles for countries to actually get together and, uh, and cooperate on, uh, on mitigation and on the achievement of, of their targets. And it also explains how the uh, for, for cooperation and it also um, has provisions to establish a centralized UN, uh, UN run uh, tool uh, to quantify and, and implement mitigation uh, projects. So it's basically uh, an article that gives means to, to countries to cooperate on, uh, on, on mitigation action. And so, why then is Article 6 so special? Uh, what about the other articles, 1 to 5? Uh, there, there, there are more than twenty. <laughs> One to five and seven to twenty. One to five and seven to twenty plus. Why are the other ones less problematic? Do you want me to take that, Stefano? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great, Kelly. Sorry. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it's the other ones are less problematic. Um. So I, I think you started by saying what is the COP and what happens there. Do you want to go into those questions first to give a little framing? That'd be very good, thank you. Okay, so the COP is the Conference of the Parties um, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So uh, quite a number of years ago before most of your students were born, um, there was a broad acknowledgement that, um, that climate change was a global problem and that we needed a global solution to it. So the countries of the world got together and um, signed, designed and signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, setting out ways in which we would um, try to avoid the most disastrous effects of climate change. Um, after that, there are no specific targets for countries in the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. Um, and the Kyoto Protocol, which came next, actually gave developed countries in the Kyoto Protocol, Annex A countries, targets um, to achieve with respect to climate change. But it only gave it less than half of the world um, these targets, which was a real problem in terms of addressing global climate change. So the Paris Agreement, for the first time ever, says that all countries have to come together and have a target, these nationally determined commitment, NDCs, that Stefano was talking about. Um, and the Paris Agreement has all these articles and, and at quite a high level um, says what we need to do about these mitigation targets, but also sets up um, frameworks for action on adaptation or resiliency, you know, adapting to climate change, which is inevitable. Um, setting out a temperature goal, and um, also establishing some rules for how international finance would also 
um, be part of the solution to this. So it's it's threefold, mitigation, adaptation, and finance. And the different articles address different parts of climate change that we need to address. So as Stefano said, we've got, we've got um, the general temperature goal, two degrees, um, aiming for 1.5 degrees. Um, we've got the mitigation targets, these nationally determined commitments. And the fact that they are nationally determined was what opened up the Paris Agreement, which allowed it to happen. So these aren't UN defined targets. These are targets defined by each country. Is, am, um, I right to, am I right to say, Kelly, that one of the stumbling blocks at Copenhagen was that the, the, the targets were uh, imposed and that no one could agree to them because they were being imposed from above, as it were, whereas uh, Paris had the, the, the flexibility that people could make their own, uh, make their own commitments. Yeah, I think, I think Copenhagen had a lot of stumbling blocks, but it is, it is definitely true that after Copenhagen, the idea of national determination, this, these nationally determined targets, um, is what opened up space for um, the Paris Agreement, which was signed in, which was finalized in 2015 and entered into force in the following year, um, in 2016. Um, but these these NDCs, these nationally determined commitments, are really different, right? Because they're nationally determined, um, they don't look the same. Sometimes it's um, a percentage reduction from a historical base year. Sometimes it's an intensity target. Um, several countries have sort of renewable energy targets or maybe several components of an NDC. Some are about forests, some are about renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you've got these completely heterogeneous NDCs, and Article 6 is complicated because of that. So what Article 6 says is you can achieve your NDC using reductions that you got somewhere else. Um, the give, thing give, is, us a, give us an example of is, that. Give us an example yeah. of that. Um, I mean, this is, this is crucial for cost effectiveness. So it is generally true that emission reductions or mitigation can be cheaper in some places than they are in others. So if countries want to be really ambitious, they can source emission reductions in another country and use it to achieve their own NDC, which, which just means that globally we're, we're maximizing cost effectiveness. We're making sure that the most reductions happen where they're most cost effective. Um, so you see this in regional systems, and Peter can talk to this, but for, so for instance, in the EU, you have an emissions trading system, um, and that emissions trading system works on a company by company level in the same way. So companies are allowed, a, a cap is established for the entire EU, and then companies in the EU trade um, in order to maximize the cost effectiveness of achieving that overall cap. Article six allows that to happen between nations. Um, and so, you know, the EU will link its emissions trading system with Switzerland and it will use article six potentially to account for the result of that link. California and Quebec have linked their emissions trading systems. They will potentially, the US and Canada will potentially use article six to account for that link, you know, how, how that falls out. Um, Canada have already said that they're gonna source emission reductions elsewhere in order to achieve their NDC. Um, New Zealand have said that, Switzerland have said that. Um, so there are a lot of countries that say in their nationally determined commitments that they're gonna be looking for emission reduction potential in other countries and using that towards their NDC. What makes article six complicated is now you're looking at to, you know, the rules that apply to two countries or many countries, depending on how the agreement is arranged. And that just makes it complicated. There's a lot of detail required in order to get that right. And right now we've, we've sorted out most of the technical detail and what's left are some major political issues about how countries see accounting or their NDCs. Accurate to say that a 
part of the issue with Article 6 is that very easily it can lead to double counting of these emission reductions? Um, Article 6, the rules in Article 6 are designed to avoid double counting. That is their fundamental purpose. So it is accurate to say that if we don't get the rules right, double counting is a risk. And that's why the rules, getting the rules right is so important. And it's also why you've seen many, many, many countries time and again say not good enough on Article 6. Um, not getting those rules right is way too big a risk in terms of environmental integrity um, and ambition and everything else. So countries just aren't going to accept a not good enough answer on that. Because if we get it wrong, it will lead to double counting, which will undermine the integrity of the Paris Agreement as a whole. So is double, is double counting, am I right in thinking that, let's suppose country A says, oh, we will pay for some uh, solar panels in country B. And then country A claims the credit and, and country B claims the credit. Does that That's double right. Counting? Yeah, so, so what happens is if, if country A pays for mitigation in country B, country B has to give up the right to that mitigation. So when country B report their inventories, so say country B reduce their emissions, that's gonna show up in their greenhouse gas inventory. And if they don't give up that claim because they've sold it to country A who's now using it, it's double counting. Right. So when they report their inventory, their inventory is accurate in terms of their emissions, but it includes an emission reduction that they have sold. So they need to add that back in to their total so that country A can claim it. Otherwise, both countries are claiming it and we're in trouble. Wow. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I know uh, Alex was asking earlier, there's 6.2, there's, what were that? which ones? 6.2, 6.4. So I've heard um, the issue of whether we will be able to use the old credits from the Kyoto Protocol can be transferred yeah. to the Paris Agreement. How does that work? Where's the main issue with that? So I, I'll let Peter and Stefano answer that, but I, I'll just yeah. quickly let you know, there are, so there are nine paragraphs in Article 6. And three of those are what we call operative paragraphs, meaning we're defining rules for three of them. So 6.2 um, is generally like the accounting framework, right? That's where we're really defining the rules about avoiding double counting. 6.4 is a central UN mechanism. And it's a lot like um, what we saw under the Kyoto Protocol, the clean development mechanism that you were just talking about, CDM. So it's a place where you can take emission reductions and get them UN certified and then transfer them, in which case the accounting of that transfer would be picked up by 6.2. But the 6.4 is the actual certification of that mitigation. And then 6.8 is sort of, um, it's the framework for non-market approaches. So it's sort of less clear what it is, but it generally um, looks like a framework where we're going to um, pick up a lot of these synergies um, about how finance, adaptation, and mitigation all come together under Article 6. It's, it's, um, it's a framework and a discussion rather than an actual mechanism or an accounting rule. But so, on, the, on the CDM transition or the Kyoto Protocol transition question, maybe Stefano or Peter want to come in on that? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just say a couple of words real quick and then I'll leave here the floor to Peter, but um, I just wanted to, uh, to echo what uh, Kelly was saying earlier. And, um, you know, Article 6 is uh, a difficult uh, article and a difficult topic to negotiate because of uh, not reasons. And one of them is that, uh, as, we, as Kelly was explaining, it is uh, difficult from a technical point of view. It is difficult to come up with, uh, with an accounting framework based on work with uh, the diverse uh, targets that. Uh, we adopt the diversity of, uh, of each and uh, but uh, article six is very uh, you seem to be cutting out a bit well, Stefano you seem to be cu cutting in and out a bit we're losing your sound oh. sorry um is this better it's for now yeah right. keep going see you go it's uh... sorry yeah no so I was that you know 
Article 6 can be difficult from a technical point of view because of the, of the reasons that uh, Kelly was explaining, but it can also be difficult uh, from a legacy point of view. Um, and the CDN transition is one of these uh, leg legacy issues. There are a lot of uh, precedents that uh, parties look back to from the Kyoto Protocol or from previous uh, international agreements in general, and that makes the, uh, the negotiations difficult. And then it's also difficult from a political point of view because for example, related to the double counting issue, what the one country deems double counting might not be the same thing that a different country deems as uh, as double counting. And uh, on the CDN transition, this is a really difficult uh, issue. It is uh, a legacy issue from one point of view. It is a highly politicized issue, and can also be uh, a difficult uh, technical issue to sort it out. And, um, you know, to explain uh, quickly, you have uh, a market mechanism that is created under the, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, which is the agreement that uh, is in place uh, this year. Um, that mechanism was, development mechanism was used to uh, implement projects in developing countries and generate uh, emission reduction units of the CPR. Um, so basically, the question is what to do now that we will move into the Paris uh, EAT, or what to do with the with those project that is operating under the CM, what to do with the, uh, with the uh, so with the CR that have been uh, generated, and uh, there are different uh, views in the uh, in the negotiating room. There are countries that want to be able to carry over uh, those projects and want to be able over those units and, and, and use them for their uh, commitments under the Paris Agreement. Uh, but we also have other countries that want instead to start fresh and say, uh, and, and they basically think that uh, that mechanism and those units belong to the past and, and we, we should start to translate. So, Stefano, you, you're, 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 I think the network connection might be a little bit in and out because we're losing you sometimes. Uh, but, but um, P Peter, have you got anything yeah. anything to add on 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 this? Well, perhaps um, I can just uh, describe the European Union's uh, position vis-à-vis -vis the Article Six. And I might say that I'm not an EU official anymore, but I was for thirty years, and I have been to uh, many of the COPs, uh, in distant COPs, you know. Um, but basically, uh, I would say that the EU, of course, supports the Paris Agreement in its entirety. And of course, therefore, we support Article 6. Uh, and the EU appreciates its but Article 6 possibility to enable pledges or nationally determined contributions to be met more cost efficiently. Kelly has well described that. Um, However, as Stefano was describing, there's a what we call a transition issue mm. uh, between the Kyoto Protocol and the mechanism that was invented under the Kyoto Protocol called the Clean Development Mechanism and the Paris Agreement that might have its own mechanism under Article 6.4. Um, the question is rather what to do with the very many clean development mechanism credits that are already produced um, and there are basically a great many of them but there isn't very many buyers. So people who have got credits have somehow been involved in the projects that have generated credits and trying to obviously monetize the credits that they have in hand to get something for them, uh, but they need buyers. Um, and so if it were decided under the implementing provisions of the Paris Agreement to accept certain of those clean development mechanism credits, there would be then a market for them because there are already a number of countries, as Kelly has described, who are looking to buy reductions achieved in other jurisdictions. However, the discussion that's being had is very difficult um, because gradually 
during the course of the Kyoto Protocol's period of application, the European ha Union has re become rather disenchanted with the clean development mechanism. It is seen as having had weak governance and it is seen as having produced at least some credits of questionable environmental integrity. Um, and so our sort of gradual disenchantment has been shown by the gradual phasing out of certain types of CDM credits uh, by the European Union. And um, we've basically decided in the European Union that as of 2021, no CDM credits of the Kyoto Protocol can be admitted into the, into the, towards, they, none can be counted towards the fulfillment of the EU's targets under the Paris Agreement. What, what, what about, that's the decision what about, that's taken. But what about those countries that have, um, have not uh, taken that route? Some countries will want to, uh, to maintain these uh, credits. Yes. So what would you say is the, why, why would the EU choose to discredit, discredit the credits if, in, in a sense? Um, what's, what's the problem with these credits that is Well, um, I mean, every type of credit got its own story. Um, but in general, um, all of these credits have been uh, generated and by a, they, an estimation of what would have been the business as usual case, and then if the if the project in question has somehow managed to reduce emissions compared to the business as usual case, that reduction of emissions is deemed to generate credits. But there are questions about the integrity of these business as usual scenarios. Uh, there's lots of questions uh, around that amongst the environmental community. And the union has just said, look, if there's serious doubts about some of the credits, we would rather set targets and fulfill those targets by actions taken within the European Union rather than elsewhere in the world. So our, our choice has rather been that for 2030, the setting of an our target in 2030 is actually what we pledged under the Paris Agreement, and it's to reduce our emissions by 40%. It has been further decided that that would be achieved domestically, i.e. within Europe. It's almost passing no judgment on past credits, um, and it's certainly in principle, the European Union is open to Article 6 being negotiated and finalised, and it's not trying to rubbish the work being done under Article 6 or the credits that might then come out of it. It's just saying that our level of ambition is being set, and we intend to fulfil that by reductions achieved on European territory. So I think it's, it's not that we're trying to undermine in any way Article 6. We're just choosing, as is the sovereign right of any party, not to use them. That's the, that's the starting point. Now, having said that, there's a few caveats, um, because we might be engaged in... Uh, ICAO is the agency, the UN agency, that governs international aviation, and they are starting a scheme to offset the emissions of the international aviation sector. Um, and we might, and I say might because it's not yet decided, but we might embrace that scheme and, and that scheme provides for offset credits to be used by airlines. Um, but I would say that the decisions on that aren't yet taken in Europe, but for the moment, we're just trying to finish the implementing provisions of Article 6 so that they're good implementing provisions. And even if we decide not to use them, we still want them to be good. Because as Kelly has described, double counting would be 
a huge dilution of effort, uh, where two countries count the same reduction. It would be, it's 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 not a robust way of accounting for emissions, and uh, so the European Union wants this Article Six to be done properly, and in that respect, is one of those parties who is rather asking for the environmental integrity of Article Six to be preserved. Above all, are you, are you, are you, it is only an accounting mechanism, um, it, and therefore <coughs> a robust one. That's what we're saying. Are you, are you, are you optimistic at all for COP26 in, in, in the sense of, of getting, getting these agreements in place? Did you ask me if I was optimistic? <laughs> yes, I did ask you, Peter, if you're optimistic. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, there have been two failed attempts to um, agree these already, so it's not going to be easy. Um, and of course, as time goes on, I think positions have tended to become entrenched, but I'm not one of the negotiators in the COPs anymore, whereas I think Kelly has a much more hands-on experience, perhaps, if I'm not too. But, um, Sorry, I'm, I'm choked on my feet. I apologize. I'm sorry you're in such a bad state, um, Kelly. But I'm anyway, drinking I, coffee too quickly. Look, I, I, I don't really want to sort of make predictions on Article <laughs> negotiations that are going forward. Um, I just say, mention that the fact that the subsidiary bodies meeting is no longer going to be taking place in May, and that's a kind of pre-meeting to the COP, um, is not, I don't think, going to be very helpful. <laughs> Um, so that's just an observation of fact, and that's nobody's fault. That's because of the coronavirus. Um, but it's is that, it's is that confirmed, Peter? Sorry, I didn't even know that was confirmed. Ah, but then I might be wrong in saying that it's been decided. Um, I, somebody did say it, but I would defer to Kelly's information sources. I'm a little bit less connected than I was. No, no, on this one, I, I, don't, I don't know that I'm completely in the loop. Everything's happening so quickly. But would you say, Kelly, that it would be a compromising if the two-week-long meeting of subsidiary bodies couldn't take place? It, it doesn't sound to me like that would be a very helpful move because those subsidiary body meetings have almost been... They try to smoothen the path for a cop. So yes. if they don't take place, the COP yeah. is going to do some high, heavy lifting in a very short space of time. Um, hence the so just, so, just to let everybody know, I think that's right. So normally we have four weeks of negotiations every year, and sometimes there are exceptional added weeks. So we have two weeks of, of what Peter's referring to, the subsidiary body. So there's the subsidiary body for science and technical advice and the subsidiary body for implementation. And that's where we really start to get to the guts of very technical issues. And Article 6 has many very technical issues. And then um, at the end of the year, we have the COP, which is two weeks. And the first week is rather technical and still has a meeting of the subsidiary bodies. And then the second week tends to be more political, where ministers come and, and hash out some um, political solutions. And that negotiating time, those four weeks a year, are, are quite critical. And sometimes they add in when there's a big agreement coming or something exceptional, they add in a week or two. Like in advance of the Paris Agreement, we had several one week convenings throughout the year in order to make sure that we were able to land the Paris Agreement in, in December 2015. But well, does that, um, does that right mean now it looks like the subsidiary bodies might be canceled. And I will say that normally, Peter's assessment is absolutely right. If we lose the negotiating time, it can put things completely back. But where we are with Article 6 is rather unique. So, and Stefano, I don't know if this is also your assessment, but what we saw is that in Madrid, we resolved most of the really um, troubling technical issues. Um, the text, the rules that we got out of Madrid are quite stable and the technical issues are looking really good. Right now, what we need is political agreement on some of these really sticky points. Um, like, does everybody need to account to avoid double counting on things that they trade? So, 
to one of their earlier questions. Brazil and some others don't think that they need to account for um, emission reductions that they sell to someone else. And, and that's a complicated, for complicated technical reasons, but it's a very fundamental political um, concern of theirs. There's also the transition issue, which you've already talked about, like how much of the Kyoto Protocol leftover stuff can be used for Paris Agreement. That's hugely political. I mean, it's technical in terms of all the number crunching that can go behind it, but it's really going to... Um, it's really going to need a political answer rather than some amount of techies rolling out number after number after number. Somebody's just going to have to make a call at some stage. Um, and then the third and massive issue is that market mechanisms under the Kyoto Protocol were also used to generate climate finance. This it was called the share of the proceeds. And every time um, a CBM credit was issued, um, not at each credit, but every time a tranche of CDM credits were issued, a portion of those went to the adaptation fund, and then those were sold to produce adaptation money. And in Article 6, that same share of proceeds exists in 6.4, but doesn't in, exist in 6.2. And developing countries, and especially the Africa group, are very strong on this, but all developing countries are aligned on this. Um, in fact, it's the only position in which they are all aligned. They want to see a share of proceeds or some sort of um, adaptation funding coming out of Article 6.2 as well as 6.4. Um, so those are the three remaining issues. They're all very, very political in nature. And to some extent, the fear is that if we start negotiating the technical issues in Substa in June, they'll just open up something that should just stay. <laughs> we need to keep what's been agreed stable and not blow it up. If it gets put on the table in front of technical negotiators, they will do what they do and they will start thinking about it again and messing with it again and they will probably blow it wide open, which isn't helpful because what we need are answers to those three very political issues. So in this one instance, it might be helpful not to have substitute discussions, but Generally, it's always helpful, and generally, we cherish all the negotiating time we have. So, are you suggesting that um, th there might be an excuse then for for postponing COP twenty six, and that that might be kind of a way of getting out having to make any of these decisions? Not at all. So, I think let's let's be clear. I think um, Article six. The biggest opportunity we had to agree Article 6 was in Madrid at COP25. We had an entire year dedicated to Article 6. Um, we needed to land it in Madrid. We didn't. International negotiators will continue to try to come to a solution. But one, one amazing thing about Article 6, it's already in Paris. We knew that this could be the case. So the rules for Article 6 matter, and they'll help. The parties can go ahead and do international cooperation now, according to robust accounting. They don't have to wait for the rules to be agreed. Um, so there'll be a continued push by that subset. But COP26 is about ambition. COP26 is about coming forward with better targets, with deeper targets. Because what we saw is that those nationally determined commitments that countries came out with in advance of Paris they're not good enough. They don't get us to two degrees. So COP26 is not about Article 6. It's about ambition. And so it needs to, I mean, I, I really think it needs to go ahead and it needs to be focused not on Article 6, but on ambition. Of course, nerds like me will continue to focus on Article 6, but the big show is really about ambition. And Bri, you can probably say more about that, and so can Peter and Stefano. Sorry, I didn't mean to hog that. So the ambition then, because it was... Um, perhaps um, uh, uh, someone can explain a little bit about uh, the five year, um, five years after, why five years after Paris is an important time. So, shall I kick off and say yeah. that? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, the, 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 the really the, the breakthrough in Paris was that we would ask countries to ratify a new process which involved all countries submitting some level of ambition on reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And it was expected that it would take quite a while for that to be ratified, and, and usually UN treaties are not quickly ratified. 
and that we should then um, expect it to be, you know, quite a difficult process to become into, to come into effect, and that people would probably lowball or, or underestimate their ambition um, in the first instance. And so, uh, uh, one of the uh, elements of the architecture of Paris, so Paris Ratchet, that you be able to then back for your targets. Now, most of these targets span this decade, so they run through 2020 and 2030. So this year is was nominated as the first of those review years. You can look again at your ambition and then decide to increase it, fit it into the into the process. Now, what, when you add up the total amount of, of nationally determined contributions so far, they're nowhere near enough to stick get us on the pathway to reach those temporary goals that were also agreed of uh, no greater than a two degree rise and then working towards a five. Um, so, so really the fact was there to say, guys, you know, we've got to do more. So 2020 is the first gap of changing it. Now in 2023, after this year, there'll be a global stop take when that part on the device look again Side, are we on track and do we need to do more kind of another ratchet in 2025? So there's this cycle of ratchet review that's been created by the Paris architect. Um, so this year is the year of bonds met submit. Now this, this isn't actually a negotiation. Uh, this is just something countries decide on their own and then submit and have those papers submitted to, into the, to the talks. And there is no formal bargaining or horse trading because it's nationally determined, right? It's not a top-down process. So really, the work needs to be done now to prepare countries for meeting their more ambitious targets. And um, the European Union, and maybe Peace can speak to you a little bit, is probably the most influential of countries that's capable of increasing its ambition, alongside maybe China, who have their mind on other things right now. But they, they used to a fairly um, it was fairly ambitious, but, it, they, but the fact that their economy decarbonizing and their carbon intensity of their economy is decreasing means they probably could uh, put forward an ambitious proposal if they felt like they should. So really it's a question of you, Chinese diplomacy, um, given that the EU and China twin make up a huge portion of global emissions, the US being the third other big player. Um, so all eyes really are on the EU and China in terms of what they'll come forward with meaningful increase. Um, and there will be a host of other countries. Some of the moral dimensions of COP will be interesting. You can see a lot of small island states and Muslim countries, they will increase their ambition, um, partly as a statement to the other big players that they should uh, and partly because you know, they're looking for finance um, to deliver on those increased ambitions. And so there'll be a there will be a raft of countries saying get higher, but we can go faster. So this is the this is the nature of the politics going in. It's not so much a negotiation as as a political um, roadmap towards hopefully some really strong collaborative statements coming out of Glasgow in twenty at the end of this year. Are there, are there any countries that you think might want to uh, reduce their ambitions, or is it? <laughs> Or is it only possible to increase them? Also, further, I, I had a question. So, right now, we we are very far away from from meeting our two degree goal. Um, personally, how optimistic do you feel that this COP will actually be a big positive step forwards in terms of ambition in that way? Personally, um, I think what what this COP could usefully do is that a um, a new um, set of expectations for the coming decade of how we're going to be engaging in this question of ambition going forward. So, so it, we really have to make huge progress this decade, and the way that our the, the way that the UN process is set up is really um, a hangover from an, a top-down system, which we're no longer using really. So, I'm, actually, I think I'm most hope for is that Glasgow will kick off almost an implementation review of do we have the right do we have the right processes now in the UN talks that help us use the death the next decade to, to its best effect and it might be this is a personal thought but it might be that some 
more sectoral conversations start to happen in those talks. If you ever go to a COP um, on the inside, you rarely hear the word um, coal or oil or gas mentioned, or, or indeed sectors of the economy very rarely get talked about. It's about rules of engagement and um, and quite technical issues. And it and it meant that it, you can go through a you can go through a COP negotiation and almost never really come across the sort that a conversation about how we're going to actually in the real economy stop ourselves from burning coal or, or take oil out of transport. And I think what we might find is in order to get get ourselves on the right track collaborating internationally, we might have to start having some of those sector conversations inside the talks. Now, that's not how it's currently set up. You'd have to have a review to have a trigger a review in Glasgow to even start to have those conversations. So, but that would be probably a wise thing to enable us to just take a check on post Paris, are we, do we have the right um, level? It's not very technical, boring up. <laughs> you're, bre you're breaking up again a bit, Brani. Oh, great. You're breaking up again a bit, Brani. I'm not sure what the uh, network is doing. Oh, so, sure I, I think I, I, I heard somebody can... ask a question about whether um, um, ambition always has to be enhanced, or could, could countries go backwards? Yes. So, the, the, <laughs> this, this will be entertaining. So, oh, but by, um, the way, by the way, Kelly, we don't have you on video, but we have the sound. Oh, let's see. Uh, my video is on. Let's see what's going on. There you go. There, is that better? Yep. Hi. So, <laughs> um, okay, so the Paris Agreement itself says that, um, well, in fact, I'll read it. Why not? Let's see. Each party's successive nationally determined contribution will represent a progression beyond the party's then current nationally determined contribution and reflect its highest possible ambition. So that's interesting for a couple reasons. Um, in, in agreements, normally we have shalls and shoulds, right? Shall is an obligation and should is a strong suggestion. And sometimes we have shall um, implement greatest efforts or shall to the extent possible, which softens that legal obligation of, of, the, of the shall. This paragraph, right here almost took down the Paris Agreement and the final hours in Paris because um, there, were, there was one country, a really big country, um, that that paragraph went into the last hours of Paris saying shall. And, and this is the politics of it. That, that undermined the national determination of these commitments, right? A country can be encouraged to always progress in terms of ambition, but establishing a legally binding obligation to progress was too far for some big, for one very large emitter, and maybe the country that I'm sitting in right now. Just so maybe. That, that shall was changed to a will through a technical correction on the podium in the last minutes of Paris. Um, because will is a statement of fact and not a legal obligation. So it is a statement of fact right now that NBCs will progress beyond what they are right now. But there is no legal obligation for the ambition to always go upwards. And that might be a good thing in light of, for instance, if we have a new US president come, I mean, we're gonna know, like, right? The election is gonna happen just before COP26. We won't have a new president yet, but if we do have the prospect of a new president, every single Democratic candidate has said the first thing they will do is rejoin the Paris Agreement. But the US, who have a 2025 target of minus 26 to 28%, cannot achieve that target because the Trump administration has taken away all the policies that they would need to achieve that target. So the US are in a in a situation if they can re-enter and we're not facing a Trump two, if they can come back, they're gonna have to decide what they can do. And it may be less than they originally put forward because this administration has undermined their ability to achieve those targets. 
Um, there, I think that Japan are also looking at their NDC and are a little bit worried about it. But those are rumors, and we're not exactly sure what's going on with Japan. But isn't, um, it, isn't it the case, Kelly, that in the U.S. there are um, is it fourteen states that are um, that are really uh, essentially not themselves wanting to withdraw from the uh, from the the Paris Agreement. And can, can those states act in any sense unilaterally? Um, I think Stefano has to leave in like four minutes, so I'd like to give him last words. Stefano, but, what do you think? Sorry, can, 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 you, can you repeat that? It was uh, breaking up a little bit. Well, he's uh, he's uh, asking if the U.S. states could, could join or they want to stay in. Um, I heard that California worked with some car companies to set better um, efficiency targets. Is that possible on a larger scale with more states? Yeah. What? I'm no, I, I'm no lawyer, but that uh, that is a difficult question. I mean, the, the Paris Agreement and the, the way the UN process uh, works in general, it is between uh, nations and not mm. uh, it doesn't work with subnational uh, entities. Now, um, you know that is a question for example, that also came up when uh, Trump announced the uh, effectively the Paris Agreement. Because uh, a province in Canada is linked with a with a with a subnational ETS in California, so effectively, a still question came up in the context of how that linkage work uh, under Article Six, if a situation where that linkage will be between uh, a part of the agreement, so Canada uh, and a non-party. Uh, so the uh, the U.S., uh, which in my question, uh, question not one had a uh, definitive uh, answer to that. Um, one more uh, uh, thing that I wanted to uh, mention in the context of the respective condition uh, of COP26 and uh, how this might play out is that. Uh, Observe actually how things play out, and, and that's because uh, the current entities were uh, put forward uh, in the run up to the COP1 uh, in Paris. They were, put, they were put forward before uh, the Paris Agreement existed, before the country knew what uh, was going to be in And around 50% of those entities meant of the uh, international markets as a way to, uh, to achieve their target or as a way to, uh, to attract finance to um, to, uh, to their target. Um, so now that Stefano, we're we're losing your we're losing your sound. I'm wondering whether if you turned off your video, we might get better sound. Oh. Um, is it uh, is it better now? That's good. At the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sorry, no. I was just saying that I think it would be interesting to observe how the uh, the discussion on uh, on raising ambition as part of the next uh, round of commitments that will be put forward at uh, COP twenty six will interact with uh, with Article six and with the notion of uh, having international markets, and that's because. Uh, when the current commitments were put forward was the run-up to, to COP21 in Paris, the time when uh, parties didn't know, uh, countries didn't know uh, what the agreement would look like, and they didn't even know that uh, Article 6 would exist. And still, at the time, around 50% of the NDC mentioned the potential use of uh, international markets, so what came to uh, Article 6 as a way to try to meet their target, or as a way to finance the uh, uh, the commitment uh, that we're putting forward. Um, so now that we have our system in place, even though we don't have uh, goods, yet, I think we think how uh, international markets and the use of Article 6 will be reflected in the next uh, round of, uh, of forward. Because as Kelly was saying, 
there's a huge potential in uh, international cooperation in terms of what uh, additional mitigation can achieve. So I think it would be interesting to see if uh, countries would be uh, willing to include that in a more detailed way in the new indices that we put uh, forward. So that would be an interesting space to uh, look for. Um, having said that, I'm afraid I need to jump uh, now. Uh, ask me question, or otherwise I'll uh, go on uh, with the conversation. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you, Stefano, for your, your contribution. Um, it's very interesting to hear <laughs> how complicated things are. We do have some questions coming from, from the YouTube live yeah. chat, if, if you want to get into those. Um, we have one suggesting that the, currently the countries can't seem to all agree on one unanimous solution. Is there a chance of some splintering off and just going after Article 6 on their own just to get some sort of progress? Or is that just not possible within the regulations and within the structure of the UN? And oh. well? so, so can some countries go out alone, as it were, do yeah. their own thing? Exactly. So countries can go out alone under 6.2. They can pursue international cooperation and account for it under 6.2. 6.4 requires UN agreement to be set up. Is that because 6.4, 6.4 I think you were saying was the, um, what did you call it, the, the, the official UN uh, stamp of approval? Of yeah, a... so 6.4 requires the establishment of a UN body to certify these reductions. So without agreement, that body isn't established and 6.4 doesn't exist. It doesn't exist at the moment? or it... No, I mean, 6.4 can't function without agreement. Okay. Because it can't establish the body which supervises it. So there's a supervisory body that, that, um, that will be stood up to supervise the 6-4 mechanism. And without agreed rules, you can't stand up that body. Because one of the things those rules will um, include is how that body is constituted. Like, where, how, many, how many people are on the body? Where are those people from? Um, how does voting work? All of those will be established in the rules. But so for, for, a country, well, for a country to go it alone, for a country yeah. to go it alone, what, what do they have to, how do they have to, how does it work in, under 6.2 for a country to go it alone? So um, actually, you know, to avoid double counting, you rely heavily on the transparency framework and the transparency framework is Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. And it is where like the obligation to report your greenhouse gas inventory and to track progress towards your NDC and um, to report on different finance obligations and everything. It is sort of the heart of the Paris Agreement and was probably one of the most hard fought articles. Um, so the, um, that transparency framework when they when they agreed the rules in Katowice Poland at COP 24 um, they actually put in a paragraph 77d that accommodates um, the accounting framework for article 6 so that has the basics necessary to avoid double counting already so countries could go it alone and use that in order to avoid double counting Obviously, the more detailed rules we get, the better uh, and the more robust. And so we should definitely not give up on trying to agree the really good text that came out of um, Madrid. But as an interim solution on a sort of pilot basis, countries could use um, the framework that is already there and continue to, um, to account for their cooperative approaches. I, I have a, a question which is kind of, I'm not sure whether it's related, but what is the Warsaw International Mechanism? Is that the right, is that the, the whim? Is that what it's, is that the right thing? The, that's Red Plus, that's tropical deforestation. It's, sorry? So it's avoiding, it's the reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation. It's, um, it's avoiding tropical deforestation. It's a, it's right now a finance mechanism to um, incentivize the avoidance of um, tropical deforestation. And 
why, this has come up in conversation that this is also a difficulty. And I'm not sure why. Is it? Uh, well, I think uh, tropical deforestation is a difficulty, considering the Amazon fires last year and things like that. But that framework is generally agreed. Yes, there are a lot of complexities around it. Is it, um, is it, is it linked? It was something about the way it links to loss and damage or... Oh, loss and damage is certainly a difficulty. Um, Peter, do you want to take loss and damage? Because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can have a go, but I, I don't yeah, know a great deal about it. But I think loss and damage. No, I, I shouldn't go far along this explanation. Um, because I might make a major mistake. I'm not an expert in this. But I, I think one of the one of the questions that comes up is to what extent is um, uh, any commitment through the COP to um, to create a fund for uh, for loss and damage? To to what extent it it implies a, a, a liability that that uh, if you contribute to this fund, you're admitting that you, you are, uh, you're culpable, you, you, you're, 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 you've admitted li liability. Is that, is that an issue? I don't know the answer to your question, Hugh. I'm sorry. Um, it's yeah, not I think really we'd have to have a special loss and damage session, really. Uh, and you know, the other there's lots of other controversies that you could have a we could have a transparency session as well, which is another <laughs> thing that, you know, people love to get. Um, uh, so yeah, it's <coughs> people interpret loss and damage differently. Um, what? If I may come back and just say something that was a little bit connecting with what we were talking about a bit earlier um, on whether parties are going to increase their pledges uh, in Glasgow. Oh, yeah. Um, just so that I say it, because um, I'd be killed if I didn't from by EU people. Um, but I mean, the European Commission um, has just last week proposed what we call a climate law, uh, which would when adopted, uh, become the first sort of legal instrument that would exist that commits the EU to carbon neutrality in 2050. So that's a long-term strategy that, you know, we're sort of working on. Um, and I think there is a hope that it could possibly be finished and the law adopted in a first reading agreement, which is as fast as possible type of agreement, um, before the conference in Glasgow. However, um, the EU, therefore, is positioning itself towards carbon neutrality in 2050. However, the real political hot potato at the moment is the 2030 target the European Union has made, and what was its nationally determined commitment under the Paris Agreement. And that is now to reduce emissions by 40% in 2030. The European Commission president has committed to making a proposal to increase that target, to become more ambitious. And she and the Commission have indicated that they will suggest between 50 and 55% reduction compared with the base year, as always, in 1990. That legal proposal the Commission wants to make in September, which, wouldn't, uh, which would be sort of positioning for the COP, but it wouldn't stand any chance of adoption in the legal form by the COP. But what the European Parliament is planning to do is to insert such a more ambitious target into the climate law. Um, which could just possibly be done in time. But the, the fact is that that increased ambition, whether it be 50%, whether it be 55 or whether it be some figure in between, is something that will be hard negotiations ahead and just might not be possible to do in before Glasgow. But what you can see is the European Union is trying its best to deliver a more ambitious pledge 
under the Paris Agreement. And that is, it's heavy lifting, it takes time, but we're clearly going down that road. Um, other parties might do the same, but we've always taken that sort of presumption that we must do things first and show that it can be done. And um, that's, if you like, the, the inspiration for such sort of self-flagellation because, you know, we have always been putting ourselves up front, making ambitious commitments that we're not sure we can meet. I mean, let's face it, 55% reduction is a huge stepping up of ambition in just a, a pure 10 years, you know. So um, let's see, let's watch it. But and do you um, think I wouldn't think Glasgow will be determined to be successful or not just on the strength of what the European Commission's proposal may have become by that time. What's important for Glasgow is that the European Union will have submitted a long-term strategy committing itself to carbon neutrality in 2050, which is going beyond uh, any commitments that have been made previously. Um, and I hope would be seen positively by other parties. Do you think, Brani, do you think, Brani, that the, the UK also is going to be uh, making uh, commitments to, to, to be more ambitious in, in that kind of way? I think, of course, uh, the UK has already passed a law in Parliament committing to carbon neutrality in 2050. So presumably, even not being in the EU, they can subscribe to that sort of commitment, as I think other countries like Norway could do, which are EU member states. So um, there is a solid uh, support for such a uh, level of ambition. And I'm pretty confident that that will um, be agreed in the, by Europe. And to some extent, as has been explained, it is a unilateral commitment that Europe is making to do it, but it's got to be seen as a proactive move in the right direction and hopefully seen positively by other countries to try and stop any blacksliding by others. Um, difficult circumstances they might be in though, um, but I think the most sort of negative vibes we're getting is just the fact that Trump is wishing to leave the Paris Agreement and that's clearly a problem for the whole world um, and it's a pretext for many countries to just stop trying. You know. so can I just, oh sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, was gonna say on the I, I was just gonna underscore what Peter said, like um, the thing is that you have always been a leader in terms of the ambition of their targets and the reason that this current proposal is so important to try and um, get through is also because when the EU do it, it's true that there's not massive excitement um, because there's almost an expectation that the EU can lead. Um, but saying that, if the EU fail, the reverse is not true. People do care. If the EU can't do it, it'll be used as a mantra, not even the EU can do this. And that'll be, that'll be one of the worst things that could come out of it. So the EU really need to do this. And as Peter said, it's a hugely heavy lift. So any help we could get to make sure that the EU can do it. Um, the other thing is, I think that the EU's target, it may not have a massive impact in terms of direct impact on COP26. But if we are not facing a Trump two, if we have a Biden presidency or a whatever, um, a Bernie presidency, then I think that they will be pushed to more ambition by the EU's ambition because it'll be embarrassing if the EU come if the US come out with something like 25% by 2030 in light of a 55% um, target in the EU and that will matter when a new administration is considering their next target it'll matter a lot so that's really important and I just wanted to quickly go back because I think it connects to this sort of US political situation um, you weren't talking about the Warsaw framework, you were talking about the Warsaw implementation mechanism, which is loss and damage. And it is true that this sort of liability, but more importantly, the compensation elements of that, and let's have a separate meeting on that, um, okay. have been the biggest challenge. And the biggest challenge has actually been um, the United States on that. And, um, and I think it's starting to upset a lot of very vulnerable countries because it's like, why is the U.S. still driving when they've left the Paris Agreement? But that, you know, there's a, there's a broad recognition that the U.S. is really fundamental to the Paris Agreement because they're such a large emitter. Um, 
So the Paris Agreement is less potent without the world's largest, without the world's dirtiest country in. So I think that's why there's so much focus on the geopolitical changes that happen when the U.S. is in or the U.S. is out, um, kind of a thing. Well, we've got we've got. Sorry, a Brian, I know you wanted to come in. We've got, uh, um, but Brian, we've got a question from the floor here. So we'd um, like. To yeah, I just wanted to continue the discussion on um, how we can increase the ambition of different countries. And so aside from uh, nations or uh, uh, international organisations such as the EU stepping up their own um, ambition, um, are there any other ways we can incentivise countries to increase the ambition of their NDCs, um, maybe within the Paris Agreement itself or just other ways? Just wondering mm -hmm. what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. Um, yes, this, this is the, the crucial question. Um, and, and essentially, it's tricky because it, it ends up coming back to an Article 6 discussion because one way you could do it is to pay for these countries to be able to do more, um, but then you'd need rules to agree um, who, who, that, who that then counts towards, which country takes credit for. Um, but, but just, I mean, one, one of the best ways to do any of this is to prove moral. Um, leadership. And as Kelly was saying, and as Peter was saying, the EU has, has always taken the view that we, we actually have, you know, we're, we're responsible, uh, we're responsible nations and and try to advance like in the face of what could be seen as economically certain decisions. If, if the US is not playing, if Brazil pulled out, uh, China's moving uh, well, we're losing your, your sound again, Brian. I wonder whether if you turned your if you turned your video off, we might get the sound better. Okay, I'll do that. I'll sit next to my. Yeah. Is that any better? I'm literally next to the sieve. Okay, okay, that's good. Okay, so I was just saying that moral leadership is a really important aspect of all of this, especially when you've got economists telling you this is crazy and you can do it. Um, and the UK has a really important role because we we get. To stand our NDC. We've been part of the EU NDC until now, and we could set a target. But um, well, we certainly could set a target at 60% um, of 1990. Already now, because the projected emissions are that that's, that's where our carbon budget should take us. So that would be a really good thing to do. And then to go to the Commonwealth and heads of government meetings and the pre COP meetings. And use that as a way to talk to some of the more vulnerable countries, some of the small island states, to say, "Look, we're on your, we're on your side. We're part of your gang. Uh, we're going further and faster. Um, we will help you know, create the moral um, push for other countries to do it too." So that's how you do it through the NDCs. But then there's a bigger question around: if you want real-world outcomes in different parts of the economy, can you push for Put on sexual type agreements like let's phase out coal burning in the power sector, or let's vastly increase the use of electric vehicles and transport, and have some sexual conversations in parallel with our countrywide targets. That actually might help with that. In uh, particularly as China is doing quite well on electrification and transport, you can have quite a constructive conversation with them about that. Less so on the coal in power, where they where there's a, they have a heavy lift and really will take taking time. But we need them to know that probably the single biggest uh, thing that needs to happen to get us on track for 1.5 is taking some of their coal stations offline because they have a thousand gigawatts of them. It's certainly true that um, in the UK we have a, a lot of interest in in energy efficiency technologies and in el electric vehicles and in storage and in electric electricity generation technologies. And I guess we should be um, making these technologies as freely available to other countries as possible. Is, 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 that, is that happening easily, Bryony? I mean, the, the question of technology transfer is another <laughs> the one used to it gets discussed a lot. Um, I mean, the reality is that at the moment, China has more technology to transfer to us on electrification transport than we have to them. Right. Um, 
on on other technologies as well. Um, they're likely to leap ahead. So they're um, much more in nuclear power um, than Europe is. Um, there's another, you know, question around hydrogen. And China is bringing down the cost of electrolyzing um, water to make hydrogen because they see that as a really important um, sort of molecule that they can use to substitute coal. They're obviously going to try and crack the coal into hydrogen as well, which wouldn't be great. But there's actually a lot of investment coming in. We're losing you again, Bryony, I'm afraid. Oh dear, I don't know what to say. Except I'll hand over the baton to someone else, maybe. <laughs> well, look, I'm 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 beginning to think that we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground, and maybe we should um, perhaps have some uh, some final remarks from our uh, our skyping in. Uh, um... we, we have some more questions. Oh, we've got the a couple more questions. In, yes. In case um, I don't know who would want to answer these, but there's two, so you can take uh, whichever one you prefer. Um, two concerns. So one. Is there a risk that if, if a group like the EU leads this change and pushes for more ambitious goals, uh, companies will just move elsewhere? Or would that not be a significant enough factor and rather the EU would keep all its business while also being a, a leader? Um, and the second one is the issue of carbon neutrality. A lot of the time, it's, it's often a trick um, where burning fossil fuels in one place doesn't get reduced, the planting trees in another place isn't the same as, doesn't reduce that back to a, a neutral level, even though it is counted that way. Um, as, as Kevin Anderson said, um, according to this comment, um, it's like paying someone else to diet for you. Um, is there a way to either either through social pressures or through legislation to make sure that carbon neutrality isn't another case of greenwashing, that it actually has a tangible difference in reducing our fossil fuel use? Well, shall I reply yeah. perhaps to the first one about the EU? Um, I give an attempt anyway. There is a risk that E regulation at both the EU level, just as at the national level, makes companies less competitive in Europe um, because there is a regulatory burden that is undoubtedly put on them. Um, what we have found so far is that in Europe, uh, energy intensive industry is covered by a particular instrument called the emissions trading system and the method that the system uses to maintain the competitiveness of our companies is a to allocate allowances for free to certain sectors of, of the industry uh, that might otherwise be less competitive. So it's free allocation is our tool to address issues of competitiveness. What the incoming president of the Commission has suggested is that we might also look at the idea uh, of a border adjustment mechanism, um, although we would do that within the context of the WTO multilateral rules, if we do it at all, it's work in, it's study being done, if you like. Um, but the idea of some sort of adjustment mechanism would be with a view to protecting the competitiveness of our industries vis-a-vis -vis the imported products that often compete on our markets. So it's a debate that's going on. For now, free allocation is the way that we address competitiveness. And we have not really seen great evidence of relocation for the reasons of climate regulation. There are many reasons why companies choose to produce in other jurisdictions, China, the US, whatever. Um, and climate regulation is not usually the primary reason, for sure. At least we have found no evidence of that in the EU. But we are conscious of the fact that if we were stepping up ambitious ambitions a great deal, then the issue of competitiveness is going to rise up the agenda and the companies are worried. 
And of course, no one wants those companies to relocate because generally speaking, European uh, standards are high and the products we produce are produced energy efficiency efficiency is, is good in their production. So a ton of aluminium produced in Europe is generally cleaner than a ton of aluminium produced in other parts of the world. So if the world's using aluminium, we'd rather it came from Europe. Um, so we don't want relocation for sure. And uh, lots of thought has been given how to prevent it. Um, but I think that's the answer I would give to the first question. And oh, there was a question from the floor, indeed, if I may ask, uh, answer that, about what, the, what we're doing to try and encourage other jurisdictions to increase their pledges. And in that respect, the EU is quite actively using diplomatic channels and paying for capacity building in countries so that uh, everybody um, can learn from each other. Um, and I am at the moment uh, working for a university that was being funded and last week I spent in Cape Town, South Africa, where we were talking very constructively with South African authorities um, and industry in South Africa about what they can do. And it wasn't a question of us trying to transfer what the EU does to South Africa. South Africa is a very specific country. It's got its own challenges. It's a very coal dependent economy. But there were some sort of takeaways that we thought we could uh, share the learning that we've been through in Europe. I think we've got an incredibly good track record in our deployment of renewable energy, uh, which, you know, we have found is both a generator of uh, industry expansion, jobs. Uh, we've, we found it a growth sector. And I think any other country would like to have growth sectors in it. So a little bit of transferring of what we have learned, I think can be of benefit in other jurisdictions too, that are all facing uh, difficult and specific circumstances. I would say. So there I stop. Uh, just to say there is a sort of diplomatic outreach by the EU, but I mean, we can't make other people do stuff, but we can try to facilitate capacity building, technology transfer, uh, and that is uh, what we are about and what we're doing. And then, so Kelly, and can then I leave you the hard one, which is... <laughs> well, then, then exactly. Carbon neutrality. So, Thank you for that. Carbon neutrality? <laughs> well, I, I feel as if that... Um, if, if, I burn, if I burn a lump of coal today and then I plant a tree, that tree won't be sucking up the CO2 for several years to come. And, I mean, it takes a while for the, the trees to reach maturity. And further, yeah. if, and if that tree is then later used and, and burned, there was no point in the first place. I, mean, I, I feel as if it, it, the, the argument for offsetting by planting trees, let's say, feels a bit fuzzy, um, but perhaps you can, you can convince me that that's not the case. Yeah, so um, thanks for giving me this one, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, and I think this is, this is a, a question we get a lot, and, and especially, um, you know, I, I was in the commission for a long time, and I worked a lot on the legislation for, for land use accounting. Um, and now I'm in an environmental NGO and we get questions about this carbon neutrality claims all the time. I think that it is true that net zero and carbon neutrality is the shiny new toy and it's being used by a lot of companies. And we do have to worry about those claims and the extent to which they could be false advertising. And we do have to sort of start to put in legislation these non-financial disclosures from companies about their environmental action. Um, the EU is actually also trying to do that through the non-financial disclosure regulation that's coming out now. So that could be a really interesting place to look when it comes to these company claims. But when it comes to the EU's climate law, this climate neutral by 2050 in the UK's own law, I think we have to be really careful. They're not saying that you should plant a tree to offset coal. The way that the way that land use is, is accounted for is much more complex than planting a tree. You, what they are doing is slowing rates of deforestation. So these are not new trees. These are existing forests 
where you are accounting for the amount of CO2 that they sequester, and you are saying you have to slow your rates of deforestation and you have to better manage your forests in order to make sure that they sequester what they sequester. Um, so it's, it's much more complicated than that. And then if we go to the tropical forest example, what we're trying to do is say, stop cutting down yeah. the crucial, you know, lungs of the planet, because we just can't crack the climate crisis if we continue to deforest our tropical forest resources. So it, the math does work. The legislation that they've put in place is not greenwashing. Um, I understand the concern at a company level, and I do think we need to see some regulation on that. But when it comes to the climate neutrality goals of the EU, um, this is done with very careful accounting um, for land use over very long periods, right? So the permanence issue that you're talking about, that's taken care of in the way the accounting is done. People understand the temporary nature of um, how carbon is stored in natural, um, in land use, um, in grasslands and other things. And they understand um, the amount of degradation and all of those factors are built into calculating that sequestration rate. So it is not, um, it is not pay someone else to die for you. That is not at all relevant here. <laughs> like, okay. They, you, count, you count through satellite imagery for entire massive um, forest plots and also for their degradation and um, for their reversal of storage. For, for the amount that goes back into the atmosphere. All that's taken into account. I think that's very helpful to, um, to clarify the, the difference of the perception from at a company level and from a, from a, a national level, because that's not, that's, not, that's not often made clear. So thank you, Kelly, for that. Now, there's another question from the floor here. That was actually my question. <laughs> okay. Are you, are you happy then with that? It's quite interesting when companies use the phrase carbon neutral. Um, uh, every morning I cycle past a sign from a certain oil company saying, drive with us, drive carbon neutral, except they're still, you're still burning oil. It's, it's not the same as driving actually carbon neutral with an electric car powered solely by renewables. But yeah. it's, it's a trick they use to get more customers. And I, I suppose it's easy to think that countries are doing the same thing. Well, I, I, so I just want just to just to come back on that. It is not the case that all companies trying to achieve net neutrality or carbon neutrality are dodgy or are greenwashing. They are, in some cases, trying to act faster than their governments. It depends on where they are. But for instance, companies here in the US are finding it very difficult because they know that they need a social license to operate and they are trying to do the right thing. And offsets provide them with a viable near-term way to address hard to abate emissions. It's true, like you say, that that needs to be part of a mitigation strategy that includes curtailment of, you know, that includes stopping doing the bad stuff over time. But as a bridge to that, these kind of offsets, and some of them are very, very good, right? Some of these offsets are legitimately doing um, emission reduction, and they are legitimate and high quality mitigation activities, and oftentimes with co-benefits for local communities or for sustainable development or for biodiversity. So this can be a really good way to bridge near-term reduction with your long-term mitigation so, plans. So, so I don't want to give the impression that it's not. I just think that probably it needs to be subject to some regulation so we can start to yeah. um, smooth, smooth the curve in terms of what companies are claiming. So Kelly, wh where, would you, where would you go to, to to get the best information on whether a particular claim of, uh, of, of uh, offsetting is a is a, a really good one or not? I mean, <laughs> I, I can't tell you, I, like, we probably get a question about what is a high quality offset maybe three times a week I'm on those kind of calls. 
And um, we are actually trying to work on some advice with other NGOs because everybody wants the imprimatur, the sort of blessing of Enviros right now on this question. But I think it's something we're trying to figure out as more and more companies come forward. I do think if the EU legislation on non-financial disclosures makes sense, it could be a massive move in yeah, the right direction absolutely. in terms of what companies have to tell us in terms of their net neutrality claims. But um, there is emerging advice on this. And um, I can certainly send you the kind of studies that we're working on well, as a follow-up. Right. Can I, can I, on this question, can I just um, mention that um, if you haven't looked at it, you should all have a look at what the Microsoft um, target does. Because that's kind of like blown every other carbon neutrality claim that's, out of the water. That's right. Because that's right. essentially what it said is, uh, this is not just a flow issue, it's also a stock issue. So if you think about how we get to lower concentrations of greenhouse gases, stopping the flow annually is one thing, but then if it takes us 50 years to do that, then we will have a huge stock of emissions that are already in the atmosphere that, that we need to deal with, or we're going to be still reaping the, benefit, the, 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 the disbenefits of that stock. And so what Microsoft said is, we're actually going to make, we're going to go further than than neutral, we're going to take back emissions, compensate for historic contribution as well. Now, this the reason this is important is because if we ever did that to the real emitters, because let's face it, Microsoft's emissions are kind of tiny. Um, but if ever the oil companies or the coal companies had to face that kind of target, that would be a significant change in the dynamic around this issue of offsetting and neutrality. And so the Microsoft target is, is, I think, now the gold standard and something we should be really talking about. Yeah. Well, and it right. includes climate finance, which is so crucial. I mean, on top of doing all those good things, they, they have admitted that there needs to be investment, um, that we need climate finance in order to tackle climate change. And, and what, yeah. what, what would you say, as a rough ballpark figure, uh, how much should you be paying to offset a tonne of CO2? Um, yeah, there are different prices depending on which system you're buying from. So if you're buying in the voluntary market, um, those, those prices range from, you know, sort of five to $10 a ton. And if you're buying from a compliance market, so say uh, a California allowance or a California compliance grade offset or a Quebec allowance or Quebec um, compliance grade offset right up to the EU allowances, Actually, I don't know which is higher right now, EU ETS allowances or Korean allowances, but those are sort of the highest priced at about 20, I don't know what it is today, about $27, 24 euros, 25 euros a ton. Um, and Korea was trading there and thereabouts. So depending on what you're looking for, the, the price can range um, quite a lot. But, but you could but, also but, not, you could also decide that um, you just want to pay the moral kind of price of the social cost of carbon. And there are plenty of people, including in the, um, the judge school, there are experts in Cambridge who work on the social price of carbon. And that, that could be upwards of £50 a ton. And then you could decide to donate that to something that you think is a good cause that will help trigger political change as your own personal offset. Like, this is all about, I think, people putting money to work to try and do good things and you want to try and find points of leverage so it might be that a project somewhere that tips a new technology into being um, viable or affordable in that country is really definitely the best way to go but you might also decide you know what i want to fund greenpeace to stop coal being pulled out of the ground in germany well you know, it just there's just uh lots of ways of accounting for essentially the impact you're having and trying to do something good to come that's right. So and on the social cost of carbon, that's, um, you know, the, the IMF, uh, which is the commercial brand um, arm of the, not the IMF, the, <laughs> the I have the World Bank's commercial arm. I had the International Monetary Fund, which is not right. Um, but they encourage um, their companies to use an internal price um, cost of carbon of $75 a ton, say, for when they're talking about investments or when they're thinking about their own travel because it more reflects the, what the price should be in a two degree scenario. And that's what, um, that's what Brian is talking about. Like, so the price, the price now only reflects the fact that we don't have 
for the climate action we need. It should be much, much higher. I think that's right. I, I feel I, I, um, I grew up in Australia, so I find myself flying from, from England to Australia. And the idea that, that the offsetting is only, it's less than 10% of the price of my ticket, just doesn't, doesn't feel right. It feels too small. I feel as if it ought to be, you know, given that aviation is quite a, a, uh, a carbon intensive activity, it ought to be bigger than, than it is. But look, there's another question from the floor here. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, going back to the deforestation issue, especially in Brazil with the fires last year, um, apart from the offsetting part, do you see that there's like an independent obligation to share the burden by other countries under the common but differentiated responsibilities um, principle in like moral or legal sense and whether any such burden sharing arrangements would be practically feasible at all? What do you reckon, Kelly? Uh, Peter, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I may have uh, not quite got the question right, but the, I understand that the, the common but differentiated responsibilities principle, which has appeared, I think, in all of the major UN texts on climate change, but it equally appears in the in the agreements in the International Civil Aviation Organization and so on, it is a reference to a principle that is that basically climate change was created by the industrialized countries long before developing countries were emitting anything. And therefore, it's a common problem, in other words, that's what the common stands for, but the differentiation is that those industrialized countries uh, that developed first should take a lead and, if you like, decarbonize first. That's how the developing countries see it. Um, nowadays, of course, the biggest emitter in the world is China, and that is the developing country, uh, so-called developing country. I mean, <laughs> it's an emerging economy, and there are lots of them like that. India, Brazil, South Africa, these are big players, and they're going to get bigger. Um, and I don't think they deny their shares are big. It's about the historic um, legacy that we've left. Uh, we have got rich through, um, perhaps we were ignorant of the fact at the time, but we've got rich through emitting greenhouse gases. And I think the developing world says, look, you, you had lucky because you got rich before we really knew what the problem was. Um, and there you are, rich, and we're trying to catch up, we're trying to develop. Um, and we just think that because you're already rich, you should be taking more of a burden, and not just in terms of the commitments that we're assuming, which we did assume under the Kyoto Protocol as well. It was essentially the industrialized countries that had commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. Now everybody's got commitments, but again, uh, the Europeans as a, as a one of the early industrialized regions of the world have assumed more and more ambitious targets because we also understand the logic of the common but differentiated responsibility. But there are limits to how far that target can go. Uh, as I said, um, Europe's emissions nowadays constitute less than 10% of global emissions. Um, so whatever we've done in the past, uh, there are bigger economies emitting more and more, and these are sometimes in developing countries. So we're not, we don't think that the common but differentiated responsibility should be a template forever. It's got us started, and the Europeans have accepted this principle, and it's, it's been sort of one of the founding principles of the international agreements. However, we do feel that there needed to be and this is what the Paris Agreement brought to it. They, they basically included everybody in their obligations. They were self-determined obligations, but this global coverage was a major breakthrough. So, Peter, yeah. the, 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 question, the question I think is asking whether we in the West should be sharing the, the burden of responsibility 
of the, the fires recently in Brazil. So um, that's right, is that? Yeah, sh sharing the kind of burden of protecting the Amazon and the financial and technical costs that are involved with that. So, so, so what, what is our responsibility for the costs of protecting the Amazon? Um, well, I don't know quite how I would answer that question. Um, we are ready to give finance, and that is what we contribute to. Um, you know, the, is it called the Green Climate Fund or the Climate Green Fund? Um, but also through all sorts of international agencies, the European Union gives a lot of money, is the biggest overseas development aid donor, and indeed, as far as I'm aware, the biggest climate aid donor in the world. Um, and so we are putting money on the table, and I think it's not for us necessarily to always determine how the money should be spent. We always want it to be well spent, but there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the developing countries want to determine how it's spent themselves. Um, apart from that, of course, you know, I mean, Brazil, I'm sure I don't really know of much about the Brazilian situation in particular, but... Um, I think through this financial mechanisms that we do get ourselves involved in, we we don't, you know, we, we, we also, for instance, in the Mercosur free trade agreement, which has been negotiated but has not yet been ratified, um, but there are provisions in that free trade agreement that both sides, both the European side and the Mercosur side, are implementing the Paris Agreement. And this is... This is um, basically a sort of newer development in our trade negotiations in the EU. We did it with Canada, we did it with Japan. Um, and so we're trying to sort of lock countries in to a, a good implementation of international agreements. And should they leave the Paris Agreement, Brazil, for instance, that would be a problem for the continuation of a free trade agreement. And I mean, Brazil wants free trade with Europe as well. So it's give and take. And so there are sort of strings attached in a in a more than just diplomatic way, in a trade way. But that's at the moment uh, how we are trying to exert pressure on other other jurisdictions, which is limited. You know, they, they are sovereign in their country. Well look I think can I just have a time at fans because I think this is this is a real tension in the negotiations and leads to the cut. So you've got mitigation adaptation and finance and the balance between those three things in the negotiations is always crucial so as we look for mitigation ambition this year we will have to also have a lot of detailed discussions about enhancing finance um so this is what peter was saying the, the paris agreement establishes 100 billion us dollars a year as a floor in terms of climate finance that's not nearly enough it's nowhere it's not doesn't even scratch the surface of what's required. But all of the money required doesn't need to come from public sources, right? We know that this needs to be a mix of public and private. So yes, we all collectively bear the responsibility for the Amazon and we have to get this finance flowing. But we don't, saying that, you know, Brazil doesn't want us to decide how to protect the <laughs> Amazon for them, right? Like we're, the, the careful bit there is, yes, we need to provide finance, and I think that's the answer Peter has given, but the countries with the Amazon are not inviting us in to make the rules for them, and we have to be very careful with that climate finance. This is always a tension. Like, how patronizing are we as donors in terms of the rules that we put on the use of this climate finance? You know, what is, what is too much um, in terms of how condescending we can be about how they need to spend the money we give them and what is too little like probably a basic rule like you can't use this for arms <laughs> you know like we're not giving you climate finance in order that you buy bombs like you know but that those discussions rapidly um devolve into really detailed rules and that's why they're so tricky right you can imagine I but can it's a huge element of the Paris Agreement as climate finance, and it'll be a massive one for COP26. And can, can I just um, also just say that um, when it comes to properly pricing in the externality of, of stopping you know, deforestation in the Amazon, it might be that we need to think about ways in which the private sector is encouraged to take more of an active role, because 
ultimately it's about ensuring that the standard stock of trees is worth more standing than it is cut down and turned into really low grade agriculture. And it, it might be that there's a, another way of getting into this by essentially bringing in some of the big agro, uh, the agro kind of companies who are currently. Oh, we've lost you there, Parani. Oh, have we lost Hi. you? So, we, oh, we, I'm sorry, but I was just saying we need more people to be putting their hand in their pocket to pay for some of this damage, especially the ones who are ultimately benefiting from it. I was interested in, in Kelly's uh, comments about, um, I mean, it is a bit patronising, perhaps to say that um, we in the UK and in other countries, um, we've more or less cleared all of our um, native forest over the centuries um, to make way for, uh, for farmland. And then, so maybe in Brazil, they've got a right to say, well, if you cleared your forest, why can't we clear ours? Um, and um, it's hard to refute that argument, but we're in a position now when it's so important that we don't lose those trees. So, to what extent can we, um, do, do we have a very powerful voice given we're, we're arguing from quite a weak position? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, this is, this is one thing Brian is saying too, is like, we need to pay the, the, to some extent, I mean, making it very simplistic, we need to pay the people not to cut them down instead of the farmers relying on cutting them down in order to make a living. We need to say, well, you know, we understand that to make a living, you want to clear this for grazing land, but how about we just pay you instead of you cutting that down? I mean, very simplistically, that's what we're looking at, right? Is is providing um, finance in order to make those forests work more alive than dead. Is that kind of the, the question that you're asking? Well, look, I'm, I'm conscious that we've been, we've at, we've been at this uh, call, this um, webinar for nearly two hours, and it's been fantastic to have you on board. Um, uh, how about, have you got any parting remarks? P perhaps we'll start with Peter. Anything you'd like to, to say to us? Optimistic comments about COP26? Well, I, I hope I'm going to be able to come because it's in the UK. <laughs> Um, that's my optimism. Um, it's going to be a difficult COP, I think, because it's got the Article 6 uh, issue to resolve and one good chance of resolving it was missed, uh, which is never easy to pick up the pieces. Um, but I think, you know, in the US, might just sort of, it might be a Democrat, it might be a Republican who's elected a president, but that's going to also, uh, it's going to create some background music that might be helpful or unhelpful to the atmospherics of the COP. Um, but I think, you know, every COP tends to be seen by its presidency as a crucial COP. And I don't blame the UK one minute for thinking that this is going to be a crucial COP. Um, but there's always a COP beyond the COP. You know, they, they happen every year. Um, and what has tended to happen in the past is that some difficult COPs have failed, COP6, COP9, uh, oh no, it's COP15, I think, you know, just to count in numbers and that those were in The Hague and Copenhagen respectively. But each of them planted seeds that subsequently grew and, and became sub subsequent agreements. So I think, um, you know, one has to see this as an ongoing process um, where everyone is in, on the train and the train is moving. Of course, we want it to pick up speed and ambition and effectiveness, but it's the it is frustrating to be a negotiator in a COP. Kelly's going to be able to vouch for that. I've done it as well. It's exhausting, it's frustrating, and sometimes very disheartening when things don't go well. But um, and there have been criticisms of the COP process as inadequately. It just basically unable to meet the expectations that we have of it. But 
repeatedly people conclude it's the only thing we've got and we better work with it because there is no other fora that we can use that would be as well suited to make these sorts of negotiations. I would like the COPs to focus a little bit more on implementation and I think this was a point that Bryony made yeah. earlier because it's one thing making pledges, it's a really tough thing to actually deliver on those pledges and I think uh, all jurisdictions find that. Um, so it wouldn't be a bad thing if we were perhaps spending more time comparing notes on how we have got where we are now and what the learning processes we've all been through. That's a little bit my reflection about the COP. And um, uh, I sort of wrote a short piece after the COP in Madrid or, along those lines. But at the same time, these COPs are conferences of parties of international agreements and they continue the international agreements process. What's encouraging about the Paris Agreement is it's open-ended there is a process for increasing ambition, and that is something we've got to make work better. And every COP will be contributing to that, and I hope Glasgow will definitely be an important contribution towards making it all work better. So, Kelly, I, Kelly your, your, your parting thoughts about COP26? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, agree, I'm going to boringly agree with a lot of what Peter said. So <laughs> I know it's more exciting when people disagree, but I, I don't have much to disagree with there. I think it's true that um, everybody wants their cup to be the big cup. What I can say is I think there's a lot of excitement about COP26. And, and maybe it's because it's a UK host. Maybe it's because it's in Scotland. But it seems to be... Um, a line in the sand, whereas other cops haven't been. There wasn't nearly this much energy around Santiago before Santiago became Madrid. Um, this this seems to have really um, fired up people's imaginations about what this process can be. And then there's where I'm going to take a cue from what Peter said and what Brian, you started with. I think one of the problems that we have is that the cops everything's been agreed besides Article 6, right? And Article 6 is really hard to access for people that aren't super um, policy wonky. Um, so uh, I, I think that the COP needs to reimagine itself in terms of this implementation. Like, what are the decarbonization pathways for X, Y, and Z? Like, how are we going to do this? And I do think we need to reimagine the process so that it's actually working on something again. You know, a lot of what needs to be agreed is done and we need to move it to the next phase and, and get that process more connected with the energy we see on the ground about climate action. So I think when we first started this, one of the very first questions is what are you guys doing there and does it matter? And and I think if we can't reconnect with that mobilization that we're seeing, we're, we're losing a huge opportunity. So I would love to see the COP kind of imagine itself and determine a process that, that better connects with that and connects with implementation and decarbonization, like Peter said. Well, thank you, Kelly. And uh, Bryony, what, what are your uh, parting remarks, optimism for COP26? Um, yeah, so um, I, I, yeah, again, boringly going to agree. Um, <laughs> I think you can talk to you. A lot of the negotiators, um, and I was fortunate enough to meet with some of the previous COP presidents recently, they all expressed frustration about the kind of legacy of how the COP negotiations are structured. It's a kind of, it kind of builds up over time. It's mandated items that we have to discuss that we agreed to at the last COP and they build up. And it ends up with quite an illogical agenda. Um, and I think one of the things that took out this COP is a Glasgow review of implementation. And that would enable us to look again at you know, the standing, the subsidiary bodies on implementation and the subsidiary bodies on technical and scientific advice. Already you're alienated just by those phrases. Um, and really form should follow function. And a lot of the time, um, we're just following the form that we've inherited from 26 years of discussions. So an, a review going into this decade um, that could come out perhaps in a, a more structure, a, a more implementation focused structure for those discussions and those negotiations would be amazing. I can't see how that wouldn't involve looking at some cross-cutting themes that every, every country is facing. 
Um, we started with agriculture already being on the agenda as the first sector to make the agenda. Um, there's no reason why we can't add other sectors and start to do these cross NDC discussions and help really help forge a multilateral way forward in some of these key challenges. So that's, I think, the amazing amount of it were. Thank so, you. thank you very much to so, the speaker. So, Alex, what, what about your, <laughs> your parting thoughts? Oh, I mean, hopefully we can leave here with some wary optimism, let's say. It's, it's not going to be an easy cough, but hopefully we will get some, some big changes. Well, it's been, help crossed. it's been helpful to get an insight to the complexities. Oh, I yeah. think it's, it doesn't sound like it's going to be easy. Well, look, thank you very much. Thank you for attending, and thank you those who have been watching online and let's uh, try and do uh, something like this again uh, th thank you peter Bryony, and kelly for bring, being involved and thank you for being thank you <laughs> okay bye. Bye, bye thank you goodbye bye -bye. thank you very much bye -bye. and uh thank you mike for his patience in <laughs> organizing this uh this webinar and um good. shall we do it again sometime <laughs> great thank you